All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to close out our Pilsner series by brewing what is probably going to be the next Pilsner style to be added to the BJCP, and that is New Zealand Pilsner. If it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome to the channel. Thank you for checking it out. On this channel, I will typically either do a grain to glass video like the one you're watching right now, or I'll do a shorter video on other various topics in home brewing. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, and also hit that like button as well. Also, you get to see more content like this recommended to you in the future. So this is the fifth and final video in my Pilsner series. I have brewed my way through German Pilsner, Czech Pilsner, American Pilsner, Italian Pilsner, and now finally New Zealand Pilsner. And the reason why I waited until a final video to do the New Zealand Pilsner is simply because I think it actually incorporates elements of all of the previous four into its design. And I think that's pretty cool. I think that's a pretty great way to close out the series and kind of have this culminating beer. The German and Czech Pilsners influence the New Zealand Pilsner in the boil hop regimen, the malt selections, as well as the actual water profile as well. Similar to the American Pilsner, the New Zealand Pilsner was born by using the local ingredients available. And similar to the Italian Pilsner, a New Zealand Pilsner has new school hops and also a dry hopping step. I've really, really enjoyed this Pilsner series uh, just because of how much fun I've had making all these beers, um, but also I've just learned a lot. I've kind of rekindled my appreciation for the style, and more than anything else, I've learned to appreciate the nuances that are between each of these five different kinds of Pilsner. At certain points in time, I had three or four of these Pilsners on tap at the same time, and you know what? I wasn't bored. I didn't have a problem having four different kinds of Pilsners on tap because they were sufficiently different from each other that I actually really had plenty of variety available to me. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching as much as I've enjoyed making these beers. Um, and if you have, please let me know down in the comment section. And I'm curious if you guys have any ideas for another type of series like this. Um, I had way more fun than I anticipated making this one, so I think it would be good to do something like this again. And I'd love to see what suggestions you guys have down in the comments. New Zealand Pilsner is categorized as style X5 in the BJCP, which means that it's basically on the cusp of being accepted into the BJCP as an official beer style. As I mentioned before, New Zealand Pilsner was born through the use of local ingredients in making a Pilsner style. The Pilsner is ubiquitous around the world. Probably very easy to find a Pilsner in any beer drinking nation on the face of the planet because it's just prolific everywhere. People enjoy it no matter what climate they live in. And they each have their own regional kind of tweaks to the style that make it interesting no matter where you go. And again, this is the case for the New Zealand Pilsner, but kind of on another level. If you haven't had a chance to try New Zealand hops, I highly recommend you do because they're a very unique type of hop. They tend to throw a lot of tropical fruits and passion fruits as well as lime character and that creates a sort of unique blend of flavors that you don't really get in any other type of hops and that is what makes the New Zealand Pilsner style specifically so unique. So typically you're going to see a bittering with either Pacific Jade or Pacific Gem. You see flavor and aroma additions with hops like Nelson Sauvin, Motueka, Waiti, Rewaka, and a bunch of others. Similar to the Italian Pilsner, we're upping the ante on hop expression in terms of aromatics and flavor uh, when compared to your typical European Pilsner style. And again, we're also trying to prevent this from becoming an IPA. It's really not supposed to be uh, as bitter. This is a delicate beer style at its base. It's going to have a snappy bitterness, but at the same time, it's also going to have a delicate and expressive hop character. Uh, you should be using high quality Pilsner malts in this style and you should be able to taste that. Um, you should still have a good malt backbone to the beer in addition to having a really nice hop expression. Another cool thing is that this actually can be brewed both as an ale or a lager. So if you want to use a clean fermenting ale yeast uh, to actually make this beer with, then you are totally good to do so per the BJCP. Um, I would recommend doing that anytime that you want a clean beer anyway, but um, that's true with most types of beer in general, but uh, in this case it is specifically allowed by the BJCP, which is great. I'll be making this one as a lager though, but that being said, it's going to be a very similar recipe construction to the Italian Pilsner, uh, just with a couple different changes in terms of lessons learned from that brew, as well as uh, the, you know, 
specific New Zealand hops. Once again, I would like to thank Northern Brewer for providing the ingredients for this particular batch of beer. I've mentioned this a couple times before, but if you're not already aware, Northern Brewer is no longer owned by AB InBev, also known as Anheuser-Busch. They have been in the home brewing business for over 28 years now, which makes them a fantastic uh, resource for knowledge as well as top of the line ingredients and home brewing equipment. So if you're looking to order the ingredients to your next batch of beer online, or you're looking to pick up a new piece of equipment, go ahead and check out northernbrewer.com before you go anywhere else. So for our recipe, we're starting out with 10 pounds of Weirman Bark Pilsner Malt. Uh, this is a higher grade quality of Pilsner Malt from Weirman. It was fantastic for my Italian Pilsner. Uh, so we're going to use 10 pounds of that for the base malt. On top of that, we're adding a quarter pound of Caramunic 1. If this is starting to sound very similar to the Italian Pilsner recipe, that's because it is. And that Caramunic is going to add a touch of sweetness and a tiny little bit of contribution of color. Um, that's going to make for a pretty awesome malt backbone that I have come to enjoy after drinking several pints of my Italian Pilsner. Then we're going to add a quarter pound of acidulated malt to the uh, grist, and this is going to help keep the pH in check. Since this is going to be a very pale colored beer, I'll be using distilled water for my water profile and uh, adding a very minimal amount of brewing salts to this. So the pH is going to initially be very high, therefore we're going to try and keep it in check with the acid malt, but if that doesn't work, obviously we'll be using lactic acid to correct the mash pH. But that's in a different section of this video. So lastly, we're going to add half a pound of rice hulls. If you recall, during my Italian Pilsner brewing, I actually experienced the first stuck mash I've ever experienced um, while using a brew in a bag system, and I think that was due to the uh, intensity of the crush on the uh, bark Pilsner malt that I ordered. So uh, adding those rice hulls is just going to help me hopefully have a better uh, watering process and allow the grain basket to drain a bit easier. For hops, I've commonly been doing first work hops for my bittering edition. However, this time we're going to take it back to the German Pilsner and we're going to start out with a 60 minute bittering edition. We're going to use half an ounce of Pacific Jade to bitter this. Then we're going to bring in one ounce of Motueka at 15 minutes and one ounce of Motueka at zero minutes. Uh, and then lastly, we are going to dry hop this in primary fermentation, just like the Italian Pilsner, uh, with one ounce of Motueka as well. This is a boatload of Motueka going into this beer, um, and I'm really hoping that that character comes through in a really nice way. For yeast, I'm going to be using the classic, my favorite lager yeast of all time, the dry lager yeast from Saf Lager W3470, and I'm going to ferment it slightly warm. For our water profile, we're going to be using the exact same water profile that I used for both the Czech Pilsner and the Italian Pilsner. It just makes sense in these delicate beers, um, and it really allows the rest of the ingredients to shine. A very soft water profile that starts from a base of distilled water is honestly the best way to make a light tasting, soft, and uh, light bodied Pilsner. So our water profile is going to be 12 parts per million of calcium, 3 parts per million of magnesium, 9 parts per million of sodium, 21 parts per million of chloride, 13 parts per million of sulfate, and 23 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'll be adding uh, to 8 gallons of distilled water, 1 gram each of Epsom, calcium chloride, and sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. Last but not least, we'll be mashing this at a straight and steady 152 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, just like the Italian Pilsner, uh, and hopefully we'll get a very similar result, except with that characteristic New Zealand hops character. So without further ado, my water is all up to temperature, so let's go ahead and mash in. Unfortunately, as I was heating up the strike water for this particular batch of beer, I found out that there was actually a short in my electrical element. So I was actually forced to adapt and use a uh, slightly different take on the whole system. So what I ended up doing was using the heat stick, which I keep around kind of for these types of situations. And I've mentioned in several other videos before, uh, and I put that into my old brew kettle. Then I took the grain basket from the claw hammer system, put that in my old kettle and hooked up the recirculation to that. And it actually ended up working out pretty well. So once I reached the boil, all I needed to do was just put the heat stick in the claw hammer kettle and uh, we were off to the races. Once the strike water reached my mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash, and uh, as usual, the crush on this is kind of powdery, so there were definitely a few. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit for 10 minutes, and then I attempted to take a pH measurement, but I found out that my pH meter was broken, so unfortunately, I don't know what my mash pH was. Regardless, I let the mash sit at 152 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, and then raised the uh, whole thing to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit once the mash was done. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain. Thankfully, the rice hulls did their job and I didn't have a stuck mash this time. 
Once a decent amount of wort had drained out of the grain basket itself, I actually took it out of my old kettle and put it back into the claw hammer system with the hooks there so that I could actually fully drain. And then I actually pumped all of the wort from my old kettle into the claw hammer system. Once the lauder was underway, I set the controller to 100% power to get a good jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and I recorded a measurement of 10.8 bricks or 1042. This was actually the exact target pre-boil gravity. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition, half an ounce of Pacific Jade, and then I let the boil continue for another 45 minutes. 15 minutes from the end, I added my 15 minute hop addition, one ounce of Motueka. I also added a Whirlflock tablet, some yeast nutrient, and then I began recirculating boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it. This is, in my opinion, the easiest and best way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. Then, 15 minutes later, I killed the heat and I added my zero minute hop addition, another one ounce of Motueka. At this point, I began chilling down to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Once I hit that temperature, I pitched the yeast. I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 13 bricks or 1051, which was again, right on target. Then I aerated with pure oxygen for about a minute and left it to ferment. All right, so the fermentation on this beer is going to be um, very similar, again, to the Italian Pilsner. Are you getting a theme out of this yet? What we're gonna be doing is taking advantage of the ability of Saf Lager W3470 dry lager yeast to ferment at a higher temperature. Uh, typically, you're gonna be seeing clean results with this yeast uh, at any temperature from the typical lager temperatures of the high 40s Fahrenheit all the way up to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you could push this thing pretty far before it starts to throw off some more sulfur and sometimes banana esters. Uh, but for the most part, it'll be very clean all the way up to about 70 degrees. A nice benefit of having this high temperature lager fermentation is also that it just speeds up the overall fermentation. Your beer gets done faster and the yeast is finished fermenting faster. W3470 is one of my favorite lager yeasts and I use it probably three out of every four times I make a lager just because of how easy it is to use and it's overall just a very forgiving yeast. However, if you don't want to use a dry yeast, uh, you have a lot of options for this particular beer style. Like I said, you can make this as an ale if you want to. If you use a very clean fermenting ale strain like a uh, German ale strain or even like the cow lager strain, and if you have the ability to keep your fermentation nice and hot, go ahead and check out Lutra Quike yeast, which I use to make a superbly clean American light lager in about three days. So if you want to check out that video, that's going to pop up right here. Uh, Lutra is actually kind of a pretty amazing yeast. It is actually super clean um, and a super fast fermenter. So it's definitely a great option for you as well if you have the ability to get your temperature way up or you just happen to live in a super hot climate where you can naturally ferment at like 80 or 90 degrees. Uh, another key element to this beer is the dry hopping step. Now, just like the Italian Pilsner, we're gonna do this one during primary fermentation. Typically that means the first three to seven days, but with this yeast, it ferments so fast that I'm just gonna go ahead and dry hop on day three um, we're gonna dry hop for five days. Since there's only one ounce of dry hops, I'm gonna add them in loose. That should have no effect on the overall transfer. Um, after five days of dry hopping is complete and the beer is eight days old, we'll transfer it over into a keg and probably let it sit at room temperature for maybe a day or two just to clean up any potential diacetyl and then chuck it in the kegerator, put it on gas and start the clarifying process. You can either lager this old school style for a long period of time until it turns clean and clear or you can use some sort of cold side findings. I like to use gelatin. Um, that's probably what I will do in order to get this beer kind of ready and on tap quicker. So I'm gonna probably ferment in my spike conical I like to use that fermenter as much as possible simply because it's easy to use and has a lot of convenience features on it. However, it's not necessary to brew this type of beer with. This is a great beer to brew in a bucket simply because you're going to be dry hopping during the primary fermentation and not during the post fermentation period. So there's no danger to opening up the lid of the bucket. You're not going to invite in oxidation. Any oxygen that does enter the beer when you open the lid to dry hop it uh, is going to get consumed by the yeast that are still actively fermenting. So in my opinion, fermenter choice isn't really that important to this type of beer they're gonna do fine in pretty much every situation. So in a nutshell, I will be fermenting this with W3470 dry lager yeast at about 65 degrees, I think would be good for this, uh, probably for about seven to 10 days tops. On day three through day eight, I will dry hop. Um, and then once the dry hopping step is complete, I'll transfer the beer out of the fermenter, off of the dry hops, and into a conditioning keg, where it will stay at about room temperature probably for one or two days, just to see if it needs any additional time to clean up any uh, diacetyl. 
and then we will throw it in the kegerator, start the chilling process, start the lagering process. I'll add some cold side findings later, and that will help clarify the beer quicker. And then hopefully I'll be able to drink this clean and clear beer within a couple weeks. So hopefully a couple weeks from now, we will be drinking some nice, clean, crisp New Zealand Pilsner. New Zealand Pilsner turned out pretty dry, much drier than expected at about 10.06. Um, it's probably not too surprising with a high temperature fermentation. Fermentation for this beer went pretty well overall. Pretty similar to the Italian Pilsner. I added my dry hops in loose. Uh, this is actually a lower amount of dry hops than the Italian Pils and um, actually ended up uh, working out pretty well. It ended up getting kegged on day 10 after about day 11 or 12 when it was nice and cold. I added some gelatin to the keg to help accelerate the uh, clearing process and that took about five or six days. So at this point of filming the beer is about 18 days old and uh, it is actually looking and tasting pretty good even though it did finish a little drier than I uh, really wanted it to. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in the actual tasting section. In my opinion it's definitely a pretty good beer and uh, well worth diving into the details on. So let's go ahead and pour it. All right, so the beer is called Killer Kiwi and it comes in at 5.8% ABV and 41 IBUs. All right, so for the appearance of the beer, it is crystal clear and a really nice, perfect gold color. Um, it's definitely darker than some of the other Pilsners that I've made on this series, but that little bit of Cara Munich uh, adds a little bit of color. And I actually really find myself liking this color, especially when it's very clear like this. It pours with a really nice, fluffy, tight white head that uh, has really good head retention. Uh, actually sticks around and maintains the structure for a long period of time, uh, which is always a good thing to see in a beer like this. So the aroma on this beer is actually pretty light and delicate and subtle. Um, it's not as aromatic as I would have liked, uh, but that being said, it is uh, giving out a little bit of an impression of uh, light malt and some berry character. It definitely smells very nice and refreshing, um, but it's not a very aromatic beer uh, in general. So for the mouthfeel of the beer, uh, it's actually really quite pleasant. It's extremely drinkable. Um, again, because I'm using that Czech Pilsner water profile over and over and over again, I'm getting a very similar mouthfeel in the last several beers uh, that have been using that water profile. It is extremely soft, it's extremely delicate, it's very light, and it's got that nice little bit of crispiness on it um, that make this really quite pleasant to drink. It's uh, even at 5.8, which is a bit stronger than it was supposed to be, um, it actually is drinking very much so like a 4.5. Uh, so that's kind of what we want out of the mouthfeel. It's also very dry um, because this did finish at a very low finishing gravity. Um, again, not something that I was supposed to do, um, but it ends up being very, very dry. It has you always wanted to take another sip uh, with a beer that is dry as this one is. Despite it finishing drier than I wanted it to, and hence also ending up being a bit stronger of a beer than I wanted it to be, uh, this actually ends up tasting pretty good. At the end of the day, it does work out to be a pretty good Pilsner. The malt character in this is nice and simple. The Bark Pilsner gives you a little bit extra kind of breadiness in addition to the crackeriness that you get from the Pilsner. Um, there's also a bit of honey sweetness in here as well, um, perceived, uh, not actual sweetness, I don't think. Um, and it's actually really pretty nice. The yeast ended up leaving this super clean. There's no detectable yeast character in this whatsoever. And that's pretty awesome for a lager yeast that was fermented at 68 degrees. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that. So for the hops character in this, um, it's actually pretty noticeable and a little bit distinctive. Um, just like I said, those New Zealand hops give you a little bit different character at the end of the day. Much like the European hops that I was using in, in the previous Pilsners, uh, these are coming across in a very floral manner. But there's a small subset of flavors that really do uh, separate these from the other hops that I'm used to right now in the Pilsner series. This is a very similar berry character to the German Pilsner that I made. It's just not as intense and it's not as strong, which is really good uh, because that had a little too much of it. Um, the level of berryness, I guess, or I guess it's gooseberry, um, that's in this particular uh, Pilsner is actually really right on point for me. It's right about perfect. It does end up being a little offensive if it's in a greater quantity, I think. Um, there's also a little bit of a lime character that's coming through. That's one of those unique flavors to New Zealand hops. Um, very cool kind of character to it. 
This did end up fermenting down a little too dry. Uh, 10.06 is definitely well below where it was supposed to finish. Uh, it was supposed to finish around 10.10 or 10.12, which would have given a little bit of residual sweetness to back up all 41 IBUs of hops. I think that would have led to a little bit better expression of some of the hop flavors. I mean, it's definitely very good. It's a very drinkable beer. It's a very uh, refreshing beer, especially on a hot day. Uh, but it does kind of end up feeling a little too light. Uh, it ends up feeling a little too... Um, I don't know, it's just, you feel like there could be more to it. I suppose that's probably a pretty good segue into talking about potential improvements. Um, and yeah, first of all, I would try to get a little bit more residual sweetness in here. I prefer, uh, I would like to see this not attenuate as far. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple different ways I could do that. I could mash at a slightly higher temperature, um, which may produce the intended effects, um, but it also might make the beer a little too sweet. And then of course I could also use a little bit less attenuative yeast. Um, and that might help as well. I didn't have as much attenuation when I used the Czech lager strains, so I think that would maybe be a pretty good option for this particular beer. Then again, you may not want to ferment that lager uh, as warm as the W3470. Uh, the other thing that I would really change about this, I think I would like to see a little bit more hop expression, even though this is at 41 IBUs. Um, it's really not drinking that way. It drinks more like 20. Um, and I would like to have a little bit more aroma, uh, I think, in there as well. So I think one of the other things I would have done differently is increase the dry hop uh, amount. So probably maybe an ounce and a half um, of Motueka, or maybe choose a different hop that has a little bit more oil content in it, so you get a little bit more of those aromatics. That would give you slightly more presence of hop flavors, and it would also give you a lot more aromatics as well. It's still a good success, it's still a very tasty beer, and I do enjoy it quite a bit, and it's a good finish to my Pilsner series. So don't get me wrong, I'm very happy with the way it turned out, uh, but there are a couple things that I personally would have done differently to make it, you know, taste a little bit more the way I envisioned that it would. That being said, it's my first New Zealand Pilsner, and uh, it's definitely a style I'm not familiar with, so um, the fact that the beer came out in a good way that is drinkable in general is, is a success in my book. I'm going to reiterate one more time, I really have enjoyed doing this Pilsner series, and so much so that I'm probably going to end up doing some other type of series later on in the channel. I'm not gonna do that right away because I've got some really exciting fall and winter beers lined up uh, right now, but uh, in the spring and the summer of next year, I might look into doing another type of series because this has been a ton of fun. I've also definitely learned a lot in the entire process and I hope you guys have as well. Again, if you have any suggestions for future series ideas, let me know down in the comments below. But before I go, I wanna share with you guys a few of the takeaways that I've gotten out of this series. Um, I have brewed, like I said, five different Pilsners using a variety of different methods, but there were a couple patterns within uh, these beers. And I will say right off the bat that warm fermenting a beer with W3470 in every time that I've done it has produced a very clean beer that has uh, shown no evidence of being warm fermented. Uh, no esters whatsoever. No fusel alcohols. Um, and I would honestly say if you're looking for a very clean lager, you know, one that doesn't have a super amount of maltiness in it um, and it's just super clean, then warm fermented W3470 is a great way to go. It is going to drastically shorten your fermentation time. And I will continue to do stuff like that. The second takeaway is that I vastly prefer using cold side findings to clear out my lagers faster than traditional lagering methods. Um, I used that on, I think, four out of the five beers that I made in this series, and it really did end up working out very well. Also, I used a lot of first wort hops. I think it's tough to tell a difference between the two. Maybe it's a placebo effect, but in my mind, I really do feel like the first wort hopped beers that I made were just smoother, gentler, and more authentic tasting uh, than beers that I used a 60 minute bittering edition on. Uh, I don't know if there's really too much science with that, but I, I suspect it would have to do with European style hops and the hop oil contents within. Granted, this is a very limited data set of only five brews. I mean, it's, this is my personal opinion, not a uh, complete guide to the science of brewing. I hope you understand that. But I found myself leaning towards using those specific ingredients those specific ways. I'm also not a Cicerone, so I don't have like, you know, a ridiculously developed palate. It's really pretty hard for me to pick up on any negative consequences of taking some of the shortcuts that I took in these uh, particular brews. So whether you want to do a traditional decoction in a traditional lager or you want to just do a 152 degree Fahrenheit mash rest and uh, gelatin fine your way to success, then by all means go for whatever you want to do. And that's the whole point of home brewing. You know, we, we make a big stink over doing things the right way or the traditional way or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's just you making beer for yourself and your friends. So 
just do what you want to do and have fun with it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, please hit that like button and subscribe so you get to see more content like this if you enjoyed it. If you want to support the channel, one of the best ways to do so is to check out my merchandise store, which is down below the description box, where you can get this t-shirt and many others like it. And if you want to support the channel on a more personal basis, I also have a Patreon uh, down in the description box where you can check out some additional content and see if you like that sort of thing. Um, and a big shout out to my current patrons. You guys are really doing amazing things for this channel right now. And I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now if it wasn't for your support. So you really do have my utmost thanks. I also have an Amazon store in my description box where you can find pretty much every single piece of homebrewing equipment I've ever used. And if I liked it and I vouch for it, it's going to end up on that store. So if you're looking for a new piece of equipment, that's a great place to start because I can personally vouch for pretty much all of that equipment. If you want to follow me on more social media than just YouTube, I am also active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer where you can see uh, slightly more frequent updates of various kinds. Anyway, guys, if you made it this far, you are my true fans, and thank you for watching all the way to the end. I really do appreciate it. So, until the next one, cheers.